should not have gone on jobs, close quote. The president is back at Trump Tower in New York City now. This is the first time he's been there since he took office on January 20th, and protesters were there last night to greet him. This came hours after the president uh, condemned the hate groups involved in the Charlottesville demonstrations by name, but was not happy about the response to his comments, tweeting this, quote, made additional remarks on Charlottesville and realized once again that the hashtag fake news media will never be satisfied truly bad people. Let's go to our senior uh, White House correspondent, Jeff Zeleny. He's inside the lobby of Trump Tower in New York City right now. I take it, Jeff, the president will be speaking there later today. But how significant uh, are these latest resignations from the president's manufacturing council? Well, if I think it's fairly significant, I mean, the president likes nothing more than to be surrounded by business leaders, CEOs, other corporate uh, titans. He has them into the White House very often. And to have the fourth member of his uh, manufacturer's advisory council saying that they simply do not want to be associated with him or the White House is significant. I am told the White House was working behind the scenes earlier this morning to try and prevent any other uh, departures. Now, uh, some CEOs have issued uh, statements of support saying they want to work with the president. Others have not commented uh, at all, but having the fourth resignation, Wolf, is certainly something that the White House uh, would not like to see, despite the president's um, assertion online on social media saying that you know he can find uh, other people who want to be involved and his focus is on jobs. This does sting because it's a repudiation, indeed, of what the president is trying to do. And it's a sign, Wolf. These are all coming. Three of these resignations have come after those remarks yesterday in the White House news trying to, trying to clean all this up. The president was uh, active on Twitter once again this morning. Uh, Jeff, uh, let's talk about another one of his right. tweets. Uh, did he undercut his own message? It was a strong statement he delivered in Charlotte's, uh, on Charlottesville yesterday by uh, retweeting a right-wing conspiracy theorist. Well, if he certainly was at odds with uh, his words yesterday. I mean, when he was speaking in the White House, it was uh, certainly a presidential moment. He was calling for national unity. He called out you know, the white supremacist groups, the uh, Ku Klux Klan and others, as repugnant. Well, then hours later, he was uh, essentially endorsing the view of a leading conspiracy theorist. His name is, is a Jack Posopic, and he is uh, one of the people who's been involved in the you know, spreading of uh, conspiracies and other things online, the uh, Pizzagate situation uh, during the campaign last year and other things. And Wolf, the, uh, by associating him with those conspiracy theories, it was certainly at odds with the, what, what the White House was trying to do, was trying to move on beyond this. But Wolf, it's, it goes to show when the president is speaking on teleprompter, he was certainly locked on a message of reconciliation. When he was on Twitter, certainly much different. Yeah, certainly is. Uh, all right, Jeff, thanks very much. Jeff Selleny, inside Trump Tower in New York City, standing by a little while from now. Uh, we're going to hear, uh, supposedly, from the president in that lobby. We'll have coverage of that right here on CNN. In the meantime, let's get some perspective on all these late-breaking developments. So we have CNN political analyst uh, David Drucker. He's with us. He's a senior congressional correspondent for the Washington Examiner. Our CNN political reporter and editor-at-large, Chris Saliza, and CNN politics senior writer, Juana Summers. So, Juana, you wrote an important piece on CNN politics uh, in which you said what the president didn't say in his statement was also significant. Tell us about that. So in the piece, I talk about what the president did say, which was to decry racism as evil and to say that he does not stand behind the bigotry and hate and violence that we saw in Charlottesville, Virginia over the weekend. But something really critical that this president didn't say is that he does not want the support of members of the KKK, neo-Nazis or white supremacists who back him. These are groups that have been emboldened since President Trump was elected in November. And we know this not just allegorically, it's because they've said so to us and reporters. Listen to what David Duke, the former KKK leader and Louisiana politician said. He said, this is why we voted for Donald Trump. He says he wants to make America great again. That, those are the goals we're working to. So I think that using the moral authority of his office and speaking forthrightly to the American people, he had an opportunity to say, I don't want these people behind me. If these are values you espouse, they have no place in my White House, no place in my campaign. And he didn't do that. And I think that a lot of people expected more from him. This is a president who, for whom everything is personal. He speaks very forthrightly at campaign rallies and at events. And 
that passion and that energy and that personal connection and the pushing away of those values just did not seem to exist in the statement that he gave on Monday. Well, Chris, he could fix that pretty quickly. He could tweet something along those lines. Or when he comes out in an hour or two, whenever he's coming out over there at Trump Tower in New York City, he could say what Juana is saying uh, she would have liked to have heard. Yeah, um, and it, it, to Juana's point, the, the problem here is the ambiguity. But both in the, the Saturday statement, more obviously ambiguous, the on many sides thing that clearly is not borne out by the facts. But on Monday, too, n not a clear disassociation of if you say you support me, I do not want your support, which is important to say because otherwise this will be taken, we already know is being taken as something, I hate to say this, something of a success for these folks. They got a lot of publicity, they're planning more of these rallies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, he could do it, Wolf, and he could do it easily. You know, he always brags about how many Twitter followers he has, 34, 35 million. Um, <laughs> He has sent out three tweets, I, I haven't looked since I've been on air, but three tweets about, two yesterday about the Merck CEO, and then today obviously the one that, that, that you showed about these grandstanders who had quit. He has sent out, by my count, zero tweets about Charlottesville. I always think the tweets matter because it speaks to what he really cares about, what he's really thinking. We've seen time and time again in this administration, the administration tries to do one thing, and Donald Trump says something that either somewhat or totally contradicts. This is who he is, his Twitter feed. It is the most obvious natural representation of him. So the fact that we have zero on that and three on CEOs resigning from a manufacturing council essentially saying, losers will get more of you, I think it is telling. It is telling, uh, David, what he tweets and then what he retweets or shares others' thoughts and, and sends them. The others may have, you know, 100 or 200 or 500 followers. He has uh, 35 million followers on Twitter. What he shares with his followers, that's significant as well. Well, it's what he values, right? So what Donald Trump talks about on Twitter versus the occasional teleprompter moment, there's a difference there. He values his Twitter communications. He has talked about how they're not going to take my social media away from me. And so I think that the, the trouble that Trump is running into here is he's being judged against the standard that he set. When he has something critical to say about somebody, nothing, no matter who they are, where in the world they're located, stops him from going on Twitter and being very specific in his critique or his condemnation. And so that's why it was so glaring here in that it took him a while to do this. And then when he finally did it, he responded a couple hours later calling the media as the bad people for not being satisfied with his response. And, and, and the point isn't whether or not he has a point there. A lot of his voters and a lot of voters in general may believe that we're being a little bit tough on him. He finally came out and said what needed to be said. But it goes to how Trump chooses to operate. I'd, I'd say one more thing, and it gets to what uh, Juana wrote about. In talking to uh, some Republicans yesterday, and I was talking to John Fredericks, who hosts a radio show in Southern Virginia. He is a top Trump ally in Virginia, was a big supporter of his. I was asking him, look, how do Republicans need to handle this, where you have some Republicans, especially in a, the governor and senator and Senate race in Virginia, that, are gonna, that have had some different opinions on what happened in Charlottesville. And he said, look, I don't care if it costs us voters. Republicans need to be unequivocal in saying these people are not welcome. We specifically don't want their support. And even though he wasn't telling me that that's what he wants the president to do, that's clearly that the message was that's what the president and every Republican leader needs to do is specifically tell these kooks to get lost. And I think, just yeah. very quickly, I think what's hard, Dave d touches on this. What's difficult is if you're a Republican elected official, let's say, and you look at Donald Trump more than willing on repeated occasions to call his own attorney general more than willing on Believe repeated her. occasions to call out Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Not willing uh, to call out white supremacy, neo-Nazism, and hate groups. Why, I mean, is that's, that that, Why do you think that is? Uh, asking me to try to read Donald Trump's mind is probably a really horrible idea, but I do <laughs> think that it shows just where his values are, as David and Chris put it. These are not things that are at top of mind for him. Some of the ways in which he uses Twitter, frankly, are to lash out at what he sees are political opponents, doing some of the higher things, um, using the moral authority of the office. Donald Trump has not shown himself to be a president who has that same natural communicator role in those big moments of crisis and of concern in this country, and the way that some of our past presidents on both sides of the aisle have done, particularly in his use of digital communication. His inclination here was to treat this as a law and order issue. I mean, he was talking about right. restoring order and talking about all violence. And, and I'm with you. Like, I don't want to shrink the guy because I don't, I don't know what's going on in his head. But I think that he either understands and doesn't care or doesn't understand that one of the roles that Americans of all stripes 
tend to expect from a president is the role of pastor, the role of moral leader beyond political right. leader. It's something that he didn't choose to embrace during the campaign except in a few moments, and he hasn't chosen really to embrace as president. Chris, what's happening yeah. with this uh, chief strategist, Steve Bannon? I mean, uh, in any other White House, I would say, well, this is extraordinary, sort of being allowed to twist in the wind, but, uh, but I feel like twisting in the wind is sort of the rule rather than the exception here. I mean, we've had a number of people do this. Reince Priebus was twisting the wind for quite some time before he was let go. Uh, Jeff Sessions is still in the job, but is twisting in the wind. Um, Look, I think Steve Bannon is getting it from a lot of sides. Uh, you, we, we heard the Rupert Murdoch, Anthony Scaramucci on the Colbert Report said he'd be gone if I had anything to do with it. Now, obviously, he doesn't have all that much to do with it. But don't think that Donald Trump doesn't pay attention when Anthony Scaramucci, who, yes, he had to get rid of in the White House, but has been his friend for a very long time. When Anthony Scaramucci commutes, be, communicates via the media about Steve Bannon, Donald Trump pays attention. So. Uh, Steve, we, we've gone through, my, my only caveat, normally I would say, get, if you look at these tea leaves, you would suggest Steve Bannon is not long for this job, but he may not be Wolf, but we've gone through this once before with Bannon, where it was, he was fighting with Jared Kushner, and Trump stepped in and said, figure this out, and we all thought, well, you never win a fight with the family, and he kind of laid low and survived. Uh, I don't know how many times you can do that in a normal White House, the answer is zero to one. Uh, I don't know what it is in this White House, but if you're Steve Bannon, I mean, you can't be sleeping all that well in the evenings at this point. Let's see what happens. There could be developments. Who knows? Uh, everybody stick around. Uh, David Drucker, Chris Eliza, Juana Summers, thanks very much. Coming up, why the Justice Department here in Washington now wants detailed information on more than a million people who visited a website organizing protests against uh, President Trump uh, on Inauguration Day. Also, J.D. Vance, author of Hillbilly Elegy, uh, he's standing by live. Uh, you see him right here. He's in our studio. He'll explain what he calls the troubling truth behind the rise of what's called the alt-right movement and the white supremacists. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It is Chief Strategist Stephen Bannon's turn to take center stage in the latest installment of Real Staff Wars, Trump White House edition. And as more and more Trump insiders say Bannon's days may be numbered, his allies at his old company, Breitbart, are making clear how they see this latest very public West Wing power struggle. Take a look. Report. Murdoch and White House Dems urging POTUS to dump Bannon, give Trump voters middle finger. That headline references New York Times reporting that Fox Chief Rupert Murdoch is among those recommending to the president that Bannon be shown the door. The Dems reference, of course, to presidential son-in-law Jared Kushner and his Manhattan White House allies. Now, we've known for some time Kushner and Bannon are at odds. And Breitbart and many other conservatives view Team Kushner, which includes, of course, the president's daughter Ivanka, as liberals bent on tossing away the 2016 Trump campaign agenda on immigration and other issues. Plus, as this drama continues, we were reminded last night, the former White House communications of director Anthony Scaramucci wishes he was on the job long enough, just a week, to get Bannon canned. Is Steve Bannon a white supremacist? I, again, I don't think he's a white supremacist, although I've never asked him if he's a white supremacist. What I don't like, though, is the toleration of it. Uh, it's something that should be completely and totally intolerated. And so, okay. so, so for me Not sure that's a word, intolerated. But CNN senior White House correspondent Jeff Zeleny is outside the Trump Tower where the president is. Jeff, a lot of advisors there with the president. There's a big event this afternoon. Is Steve Bannon among them? John, good afternoon. Steve Bannon, the White House chief strategist, is not here in Trump Tower. Of course, he spent so much time last year, uh, the end of the fall campaign, helping Donald Trump, helping him win the White House. He is not here in Trump Tower today. And of course, in Donald Trump's orbit, proximity to, to power is very important. So Steve Bannon, still White House chief strategist, that title is still operative, I'm told. He is keeping a low profile, we're, we're told. We believe he's still back in Washington, working out of a temporary office in the executive office building right next to the White House uh, complex, which is uh, facing some, some uh, renovations, John. But so many White House advisors are here. The Treasury Secretary, Stephen Mnuchin, just walked outside of uh, Trump Tower just a few moments ago. We've seen other advisors coming and going all morning. Steve Bannon is not among them. Uh, as you were saying in the intro there, so many people are urging the president to remove him. So many important voices the president listens to. There are also, though, some voices, I'm told, that are urging the president to keep him on board. Chief among those, conservative members of Congress, like Mark Meadows of North Carolina. He has repeatedly, I'm told, urged the president to leave Steve Bannon in place to be um, sort of worried or wary of uh, removing him because he is a, a link to the president's base. 
So this is a decision the president is wrestling with. Uh, we do not believe he will make it any time soon um, in the coming hours or perhaps even the coming days here. But Steve Bannon knows he is on uh, shaky ground, if you will. But, John, as we've seen in this White House again and again, it often takes the president a long time to act on staffing decisions. Sometimes he doesn't act at all. Sometimes people who are down now may be up in the future. Steve Bannon is certainly on that list. John. Jeff Selleny outside of Trump Tower keeping tough touch, Jeff, as the day continues. Let's bring the conversation in the room to the point uh, Jeff just made. Uh, a lot of conservatives view Steve Bannon as their conduit, and they're frankly very suspicious of the New York crowd. Reince Priebus was the establishment contact. Sean Spicer, his deputy, they're gone. Uh, will the president, it, I mean, you hear this all the time, and we've heard it before. Uh, is the president ready to do this? No, no. Yeah. if he were ready to do it, he would have done it. Uh, there's clearly, uh, the president is clearly of two or maybe more minds about this, and this does go to the conflict we've been talking about within the White House, that he has not, we have never seen Trump sort of go full Bannon uh, in policy, uh, and we also haven't seen him choose the other side. The wild card here is now that John Kelly is the chief of staff, will he be fully empowered to turn the Trump administration into what he sees it as, I think, you know, we have not, we have almost never seen Trump directly confront and fire people. Uh -huh. The question is, what has he empowered John Kelly to do? And certainly uh -huh. part of the calculation is, if you do kick out Steve Bannon, then what does he do? But what does he do? I, but I think you raise a great question. We have the new chief of staff. Everyone said this he's, man's going to bring order and discipline, military discipline, to the White House. Obviously, there's been a lot of disappointment in the president himself. Uh, last week, he was tweeting some things that people thought weren't exactly military discipline uh, to be kind. Uh, if you're John Kelly, uh, if you look at his record at Homeland Security, he and Steve Bannon are probably on the same page on a lot of the tougher immigration enforcement and those kind of things. But if you're John Kelly and your goal is to bring order to this chaotic White House, and you have Bannon fighting Jared, you can't fire the president's family. Uh, is that part of the choice here? I mean, this is kind of like whack-a-mole. It's like, if you're John Kelly, you're Seven trying to squash... Seven months into a presidential squash. administration, we're still playing whack-a-mole. Yeah, I mean, you're trying uh, to squash one kind of drama, uh, which might be replaced with another kind of drama. And so it's, it seems a little unclear uh, whether whatever problem needs to be solved will be solved by um, by excommunicating Steve Bannon from the White House. Um, and, you know, I think Bannon in general you're right might have some policy alignment with kelly on certain issues but the biggest problem in organizationally is that uh, he's seen as a force behind a lot of the factions that are ripping the white house apart and john kelly wants to get a handle on that but it's really not clear to me and, and clearly to trump that getting rid of bannon will do that uh... the idea that the base is going to go into uproar right. if bannon is um, is next is i think I can kind of see that. I think there's a certain online element of the base that will go into uproar, but that there's another argument that if you go and talk to Trump voters around the country, most of them have no idea who Steve Bannon is, um, and they probably never will. So that might be a little bit overblown by this echo chamber huh. of, um, of kind of the Breitbart world on the Internet. And, and does, does Charlottesville impact this? We were hearing this well before Charlottesville happened. And now you have people who didn't like Steve Bannon to begin with saying that, you know, he's sympathetic to the alt-right. He's too sympathetic to these white supremacists. He, you know, is he the guy behind the scenes who delayed the president coming out? We don't know answers to any of that. Uh, but people are stepping into this political opportunity. Among them, uh, Carlos Corbello, Republican congressman from Florida, listening to him here saying, you know, he didn't like Steve Bannon to begin with, and especially now, he should probably go. Steve Bannon is, is, the, is the most prominent. I think uh, a lot of these uh, ideas that you see coming from Stephen Miller are also associated uh, with these groups, and that's unfortunate. And look, I'm not saying these people are racists. I'm not saying uh, that uh, they want to advance a racist agenda, but uh, it is pretty clear uh, that they believe that uh, these groups should be accommodated. So does that dynamic, is that the last straw? Or we've seen the president in the past. He deals with these things slowly. To your point, he doesn't like to fire people in his own circle. He's been very reluctant to do that. But he, we also know that he doesn't like being told what to do. Right. And so when he hears this from the outside, is he going? Is this going to help Steve Bannon in a I weird way? I think it way? does. I, I think. I mean, look, we don't know, and we, we could, you know, he could fire Steve Bannon in an hour. And but 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 I think more likely is the situation that he gets his back up. That he does, he he says to himself, I don't want to be told by a bunch of liberals or a bunch of establishment Republicans who I can and can't have around me, including Rich, who he just dismissed summarily. Right. Exactly. And and so I, you know, I think the 
the greater possibility is that this sort of solidifies Bannon's position, but it, what it doesn't do is it doesn't resolve either the ideolo ideological fight, which we've al already talked about, and also, you know, look, he has to, in, in theory, President Trump has to get reelected, and he's got to figure out how to build a coalition that brings back, that, that holds on to that base, and that expands it beyond the 38 36 whatever it is to 50 and how you do that in a white house that's so divided between these ideas so so, di so divided too before you jump in i just want to go back to something this is on uh, meet the press on sunday with chuck todd this is just remarkable we know that steve bannon has been at odds with the national security advisor hr mcmaster again we're seven months into administration that to abby's very well apt way of putting it keeps playing staff whack-a-mole listen to this can you and Steve Bannon still work together in this White House or not? I, I, I get to work together with a broad range of talented people, and it is a privilege every day to enable the national security team. You didn't answer, can you and Steve Bannon work in that same White House? I, I, am, I am ready to work with anybody who will help advance the president's agenda and advance the, the security, prosperity of the American people. Uh, do you believe Steve Bannon does that? I, I believe that everyone who works in the White House, who has the privilege, the great privilege every day mm -hmm. of serving their nation, should be motivated uh, by, by that goal. Uh, not, nice try, Chuck. Uh, strike up the band. Uh, that was, what was that? <laughs> he wasn't clear about uh, where he stood on Bannon specifically. Oh, I think it was maybe, Look, I think, maybe pretty clear. Not by name. Uh, look, I think it's so hard to tell because there have been a thousand rumors about a thousand right. people getting fired, right. many of whom have not gotten right. fired. Um, but there is an element to this where I think the building buzz sort of reaches a crescendo and then Trump either at that point decides he's done with this person because he's not doing him much good in his view or he gets his back up and decides to wow. go the other way. So I think we might be at that deciding point right about wow. now because there has been a little bit more noise about it. I wonder if that was accelerated by the fact that perhaps Jared and Ivanka who tweeted quite clearly uh, very quickly after the Charlottesville incident um, and Bannon might have been on opposite sides of exactly how that mm -hmm. statement went down. Um, and then there's the element, too, where with the Sessions sort of trial balloon about, I don't know if it was trial balloon, a very mean trial balloon about getting rid of Sessions, that conservatives, and I would say a different section than would be, than would be supporting Bannon, right. said, hey, like, back off on yeah, this. No way. Right. He's doing the work. Um, he listened to right. that, and, and that story changed, so right. we'll see. Well, right. Trump, Trump, you know, right. likes to test people. He likes right. to torture them a little bit. He likes to hang people out to dry. There's a hot seat in the White House. Somebody's always in it. Jeff Sessions had his turn in it, despite all of his loyalty. This may just be Bannon's turn in the hot seat. Next week on Real Staff Wars, Trump edition. All right, it's only been a week, but President Trump's tough talk on China, North Korea, seems a little dated. Hi, this is President Donald Trump. And I love the people of Alabama, and I hope you go out and vote for Luther Strange for Senate. It's so important that you do. He's helping me in the Senate. He's going to get the tax cuts for us. He's doing a lot of things for the people of Alabama and for the people of the United States. You hear the voice of the president there backing Luther Strange. That's a surprise to some because President Trump makes no secret of his displeasure with Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. But those two, the president and the majority leader, on the same team today as Alabama picks candidates for the Senate seat once held by the Attorney General Jeff Sessions. It's a deep red state, so the contest that matters most is the Republican primary, where interim Senator Luther Strange has the backing of both the president and the majority leader. Now, some Trump allies are mad at the president because they see Strange as being too cozy already with Washington insiders like McConnell. And they view other Republican candidates, Congressman Mo Brooks, former state Supreme Court Justice Roy Moore, chief among them, as anti-establishment disruptors much more in the Trump 2016 mold. If one candidate cracks 50 percent, he's the nominee. If not, the top two have a runoff next month. Now, the president remains popular among Alabama Republicans and Senator Strange hopes that means a lot today. I've done everything you could possibly do to support the president's agenda. And uh, believe me, that's what the people of Alabama want to see uh, done. Molly Strange, uh, Molly Ball, you were down covering the Strange race. Can't call you Molly Strange. <laughs> uh, you were down covering this race, and you write in the Atlantic, uh, Strange himself was surprised. He nearly drove off the road when Trump called him from the White House on Tuesday afternoon, he said. Why is he so surprised? Well, it is actually an unusual thing for a sitting president to intervene in a Republican primary. Now, Strange is technically the incumbent. He was appointed to the seat. He's been there for six months. Uh, 
But a lot of the people around the president and around Luther Strange were surprised that Trump would weigh in. It is the first time the president has weighed in in a contested Republican primary. He was expected to really stay out of it. Mitch McConnell did lobby him hard to endorse Strange some months ago, uh, but when Trump declined to do that back then, it was thought that it wasn't going to happen. And so even the Strange campaign didn't know this was coming. And the way Luther Strange himself tells the story, he was driving down the highway in Alabama on Tuesday when he got a call saying, please hold for the president, and that's when he nearly drove off the road. <laughs> I will, we'll see. Nearly drove off the road. He, he didn't. And so we'll see what happens. I mean, what, what a rebuke it would be for the president if he did this rare, unusual step and Luther Strange somehow didn't make the runoff. Most people seem to think Luther Strange will make the runoff and most likely the former state Supreme Court Chief Justice Roy Moore. But the people are voting today. We'll see what happens. You never know in these low turnout, you know, special primaries. Let's look at the other candidates and who has endorsed them. Luther Strange, as we noted, has the support of President Trump and Mitch McConnell. Strange bedfellows. They've been at war with each other lately. Mo Brooks, the congressman has talk radio hosts and Fox News hosts uh, Mark Levin, Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, Roy Moore, Duck Dynasty's Phil Robinson, uh, Chuck Norris. Um, what does this tell us? Uh, we have watched. We have watched. You know, Trump won in 2016 after a hostile takeover through the Republican primaries. The Republicans control the Senate. They control the House. They control most of the governorships. The Republicans run just about everything, and yet as they do, there's still a civil war going on within the party. What are we going to learn from this? As I keep saying, sorry, broken record, but the GOP won the presidency while improbably going through a very ugly divorce, and they continue to go through that divorce, and that's what we're seeing. I think the thing about this race that's interesting is because McConnell and Trump are aligned, and those are, represent two very different forces in this battle, it will be very hard to decipher in a special election primary while it's raining in Alabama what force actually mattered here. And so I think that's going to be hard to decipher. And by the way, just for, just for a baseline on where we are in American politics, leading on the Democratic primary, Robert Kennedy Jr., no relation, just because his name is Robert Kennedy Jr. Well, some, <laughs> so. some, some, sometimes a name like that helps. I, 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 forgive me. Uh, forgive me for being unobjective here, but the Republican's going to win uh, th this race. Let's listen to This is uh, Mark Levin of Talk Radio fame. Uh, has been generally a big supporter of the president. Wants somebody to come into Washington, despises Mitch McConnell, thinks the insiders like Mitch McConnell are part of the big problem in Washington, uh, as more so than the Democrats or even the bureaucracy. Mark Levin and others blame Washington insiders, deal makers like Mitch McConnell. Listen to this disappointment with the president. And the President of the United States didn't have to do that. He could have stayed out of it, but he didn't. He put his, he put his finger on the, uh, on the scale. Luther Strange is Mitch McConnell's guy. He's a hack. He's an insider. He's got all the problems that you and I rail against day in and day out. And Donald Trump just endorsed him. Is this a one-shot, isolated frustration by slices of the party and the base that support the president? Or is this, back to the conversation we just had, a guy at 31 percent can't afford to be losing people, whether it's business CEOs quitting your manufacturing council or your allies in talk radio in the grassroots base of the Republican Party saying you're stabbing us in the back, which are words Mark Levin has used. It, it's not isolated and it's not just connected to the conversation we had, but the conversation we're going to have about Steve Bannon and maybe uh -huh. his future. And it's ultimately about this, this ideological war going on, on inside that building at 1600 Pennsylvania that's been going on uh -huh. in the party long before Donald Trump came. But when Donald Trump came and really kind of tried to fuse the sort of businessman Trump with all of the corporate interests that we've been talking about with the Bannon Breitbart um, kind of right wing of the party and you know I mean we've seen in the past how that how hard that's been in Congress and, and how that's played out and now it's playing out in the White House and and in sort of the vying back and forth and this is this is you know another one of those moments. We'll count the votes tonight we'll talk more about this race tomorrow but we'll continue the conversation as Michael notes it is all connected. Uh, Steve Bannon, no Mitch McConnell is at a most familiar setting, his Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan. There are big protests outside and also big turmoil inside as talk grows of another possible White House shakeup. This one centered on chief strategist Stephen Bannon. Is he going to be gone in a week? That's up to the president. But what do you, you think? What do you, what do you think? What does the mooch think? Well, if it was, it was up to me, he would be gone. It is primary day in Alabama. The Senate seat once held by the Attorney General Jeff Sessions is up for grabs, and the fight among Republicans is a bruising reminder the GOP, even while in charge of just about everything, is in the middle of an identity war. First, though, some breaking news. A fourth resignation from a White House Manufacturing Council. That, fresh evidence. The political fallout continues from Charlottesville and from a presidential response being panned as too little and very late.
Then he came out yesterday with a, with a better response, but it looked a little bit forced and, and half-hearted. And I think what's uh, affecting the president here is the fact that his prior statements during the campaign were, you know, he went after, you know, he had made some attacks on Mexicans, Muslims, the Indiana judge. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it, it makes these situations even more treacherous for the president. With us to share their reporting and their insights, Abby Phillip of the Washington Post, The Atlantic's Molly Ball, Michael Scher of the New York Times, and Mary Catherine Hamm of The Federalist. President Trump, as we noted, home at Trump Tower today. He believes he's done all he needs to do in the wake of the hateful marches and deadly violence this past weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia. The White House says, for example, there are no plans for the president to visit Charlottesville, and that in his view, the president said all that needed to be said when, after being pressed by senior advisors, he spoke yesterday at the White House. Racism is evil. And those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups that are repugnant to everything we hold dear as Americans. Those were welcome words from the president, but to many it was too little, and to even more, it was too late. A second, a third, and now a fourth CEO resigning from the president's manufacturing council because they don't want their brand associated with his. Kenneth Fraser of Merck Pharmaceuticals was first, followed now by the CEOs of Under Armour Intel and just moments ago by Scott Paul, who's the president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. That announcement from Paul came just moments after President Trump wrote this on Twitter. For every CEO that drops out of the Manufacturing Council, I have many to take their place. Grandstanders should not have gone on. Jobs. Maybe that's the president's reaction, but remember, CEOs track numbers, they track markets, and President Trump's already low stock is in further decline. Gallup's daily tracking has the president with just a 34% approval rating, his disapproval at a new high. 61% of Americans don't like what they see in a president about to hit the seven-month mark. How big of a deal? A fourth CEO, likely there will be more, if, even if people aren't dropping off these councils, uh, less likely to come to events with the president, at least at this moment, to sit next to him, um, his brand clearly tainted. Yeah, yeah I think it, it's, this is actually a moment in a series of moments similar to this, but one that's meaningful, I think, because, you know, if we think back six or seven months ago, there was a time when a single tweet by Donald Trump would provoke um, shutters through, you know, corporate boardrooms, um, stocks would go down. Now we're seeing almost the opposite, in part because people have, I think, made a calculation that um, it's too risky. That, you know, perhaps they don't know whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, but the level of risk is too great to associate themselves with Trump. Um, and it's not just in the corporate realm. You're seeing more and more Republicans speaking out, being willing to push back hard against him, including some unusual suspects like Cory Gardner over the weekend. And and, and you're seeing it in the military, with military leaders just saying, you know what, we need to have a different process from the way that this president is t typically wanting to operate. Twitter is not going to uh, be considered an order in, in the United States military service. And that's a, that's a big deal, and that's been happening for weeks now. I, th I mean, look, I, th I think the irony of the president's most recent tweet about grandstanding is that White House counsels are all about grandstanding. I mean, they're, right, they're ultimately about sort of that kind of political messaging. The, um, in addition to the, the lack of fear that Abby talked about that I don't think is there quite as much, there's also not in the business community and in Republican circles, not as much optimism that the president is the one that's going to help get through their other pieces of the agenda, the infrastructure that so many of these manufacturing uh, companies would have liked to see, the tax cuts that all of business wants to see. You know, if, you, if you're not scared and you also don't think that the president is bringing a lot to the table in terms of driving your agenda forward, then what advantage is there to be part of his sort of coalition, especially if the brand is a problem. And just raw math, I mean, if you're at 31%, you can't afford to be losing friends, right? Yeah, well, and he, <laughs> he makes it extremely hard to ally with, right? Like, and I think it's, it's ironic because I think he is a very transactional guy. You could get in a room with, with him and have a conversation as a CEO, and he might be like, that sounds like a great idea. Let's move on that. Um, but mm -hmm. he does so many other things that make it hard to be in that situation, um, and for politicians as well, where you don't know if he's going to spout off on you the second you leave the room or the second 
uh, you passed some legislation that was really hard to pass, and three days later uh, he's trashing Maybe Mitch it. Mitch McConnell, right? Has or sort of going after a CEO who leads the board instead right. of going after by name white nationalists. Like the, there, it is fair to say what are the priorities here. Uh, and, and it's fair to say, isn't it, that what he tweets tells us about what is most important to him, what is driving his own internal conversation. Yes, he read a statement yesterday in a teleprompter at the White House three days after Charlottesville. Uh, we're told, and I'm sure your sources say the same thing, under pressure from senior advisors saying, Mr. President, you got to clean this up. you got to do a better job here. It took three days for an American president to say neo-Nazis are bad. Um, uh, that, that's a pretty shocking thing in its own right. But then you get the pure Trump in the Twitter feed. And he's mad at these guys for, in his view, abandoning him. Uh, he has tweeted about them. First it was Ken Frazier of Merck. Uh, now these other grandstanders, as he calls them. He has not tweeted once about the KKK or neo-Nazis or white supremacists. Well, and I think, you know, the, the Donald Trump that we have always known is someone who calls himself a counterpuncher. And mm -hmm. people around him call him a counterpuncher. It's all about him. If it's good for him, he likes it. If it's bad for him, he doesn't like it. And I think what people are increasingly seeing is this isn't a calculation about what's good for America. This is a calculation about who has said nice or mean things about Donald Trump. And that is the sole basis on which he makes his judgments about who to attack, uh, who to praise. And that's why he is so uh, begrudging when it comes to condemning people who he doesn't feel that he's being attacked by. A very important point, because I want you to listen here. Here are three of the CEOs. Again, the president's poll numbers are at their worst state now, but they've been bad from the beginning. He lost the popular vote. He's had tough getting traction on some issues. These business meetings at the White House, to Michael's point, have been very important for the president to send a message. I'm going to bring back jobs. The stock market is going to do better. The economy is going to start to boom. They have been important character witnesses for the president as he tries to get started. I think he's highly passionate. Um, he definitely, it's, you know, to have such a pro-business um, president is something that's a real asset for this country. It's really in support of the tax and regulatory policies that we see the administration pushing forward uh, that really make it advantageous to do manufacturing in the U.S. It's an honor to be here at the White House, and I'm grateful for the administration's continued support for American innovation. Now, those three, uh, plus a fourth now, have walked away from this council, which denies the president either the testimony on television or those photo ops at the White House. And what, one thing that I want to highlight here, Kevin Plank, the CEO of Under Armour, has taken a lot of flack in the past for being associated with the Trump administration. He was at the White House in the very early stages, one of the first CEOs to show up in the White House. And, um, and he had some of his, uh, his sort of celebrity uh, faces of his brand basically pull out and say, we can't be associated with you because you're associated with Trump. He stayed in it up until now. That kind of tells you that I think a lot of CEOs had given it a good old try and they really feel like this is the end of the line for them. They can go no further. That's an important moment. These are not just people who have been passively going forward. Many of them had been taking a lot of flack for many, many months, and this was the final straw. And Charlottesville, the final straw. We, we do know, and you know, we'll know more about this in two weeks and two months than we do about it today in terms of the political fallout, whether the president can find a way to reset it after what I think by most, by most accounts, unless you're a total Trump loyalist, was a disappointing initial reaction on Saturday. But we know this even beforehand in our polling before Charlottesville, is Trump a person you admire? 67% of the American people say no. They don't admire the President of the United States. Uh, can Trump unite the country? Will Trump unite the country, not divide it? 35% yes, 61% no. Uh, that is part of the calculation that was already out there in the country before an event like Charlottesville. And I'm going to make a, what's probably a contrarian argument here, that by attacking these guys as grandstanders or saying I can replace you, I'm, I'm not saying that's a presidential thing to do, uh, but it puts the president at least attacking all of them. Whereas yesterday out of the box, he attacked Mr. Frazier, an African American, in the wake of Charlottesville, an African American CEO takes what he describes as a position of principle. I can't be around this guy if he's not going to be more forceful about this. Uh, the president attacked him and there's Congressman Charlie Dent uh, saying that that particular play by the president in his view, an especially bad call. I was a bit miffed yesterday when he attacked uh, Ken Frazier. I know mm. Ken. He's from Philadelphia. His yeah. father was a, a janitor. I just thought it was kind of a cheap shot. You know, other CEOs stepped off that council too. He didn't attack them. They, they weren't African American either. So I thought, you know, that, well, he didn't handle that well at all.
Now, Charlie Dent has been a critic of the president from the beginning. He's a more moderate Republican. The president's more toxic in his district, if you will, so you have to filter the politics through that. But CEOs leaving the council, more and more Republicans openly coming out with no hesitation now, not trying to sugarcoat their words in any way. Uh, is this some sort of a breaking point for the president? Well, I, look, I think, I think it is indicative of a lot of problems on the horizon when, after Labor Day, everybody comes back and they're going to try to pull together as a party to try to get something, salvage something out of this first year of the president, uh, president's term. Uh, and, and look, I think Trump, Trump's problem is that he's measured, we know him, we've seen him over the last couple of years, and you know, I, I thought about this the other day, that when you watched his passion on the campaign trail about the, uh, uh, the people who, in this country, who were killed by, in his words, illegal immigrants who came to this country right. and murdered people. There's that case in San Francisco that he talked a case lot about. Right, yeah. You know, he would sit there at the podium and grip the podium and speak in emotional, powerful terms about his, you know, anger and frustration with that, those cases. And he could go on for, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes at these rallies. And then you watched what he did uh, even on, uh, over the weekend, and it just wasn't filled with any of that, right? It was reading words off a page. So even if he read the right words, you didn't see, people didn't see, and none of his allies in Capitol Hill saw any of that passion, and I think that's what huh. they're reacting to. Well, well, and to your point, John, I think it would be one thing if he was intentionally, as a category, going after big business, right? right. If the attacks on CEOs were part of a larger right. message that was saying, mm -hmm. I'm on the side of the people, I'm not on the side of these, these you know, fat cat CEOs, because a lot of what was attractive to so many voters right. who were not traditional Republican primary voters or Republican general election voters was that Trump did seem independent from uh, the the Republican donor class and the economic agenda of the sort of one percenters uh, and so but this was obviously done as a sort of petty personal uh, retaliation it wasn't part of Trump really coming up with a coherent message of saying that he was going to fight for the little guy and you know the the, the CEOs on that council uh, obviously felt that they weren't getting anything out of the president in terms of the trade agenda or uh, bringing manufacturing jobs back. And, and he is on the record heaping praise on all of them uh, when they were at those meetings, when they were with him, singling them all out to say nice things about them. But now that they've done something he doesn't like, they're grandstanders. Yeah, a couple things about this. When it comes to the credibility numbers and the lack of admiration, that a lot of that was built into this when he came into office. That's what people right. voted for. Yeah, and my question is, how do you, can, can no, no. you possibly, Charlotte, Charlottesville right. was an opportunity to start to make it better yes. if he had been well, strong out of the gate. My point is yeah. that when you're making that calculation and that's the guy you're voting for, uh, you will lose the guy who has the moral clarity at the podium at that moment. If we're going to have a national conversation about political violence, which by the way should not be limited to one kind of political violence, you need a guy who's careful and